Excellent stuff. Morning, everyone. Great to see you at church today. Also, welcome. And um, great stuff about the money course. Please do have a look in the King's Life for that. Obviously, some big news this week. Everyone may have seen this. Billy Graham, American preacher and evangelist, um, one of my heroes. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Died at the age of 99. He personally preached to over 200 million people in his lifetime. Just phenomenal. And um, he said this once, Billy Graham. He said, someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. I shall be more alive than I am now. I would just have changed my address. I would have gone into the presence of God. How awesome is that? (laughs) Billy Graham knew what it meant to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. He lived with absolute certainty of what his life was about, what his life was for, where his life was heading, and he lived in that way. I mean, the impact of his life is phenomenal. There's probably people here that came to faith at a Billy Graham mission, or their parents came to faith. If your life was impacted in some way by Billy Graham, either your parents or directly, can you raise your hands? Wow, look at that. That's amazing. Now, our own church, Terry Virgo, who um, is a member here, he's in Washington in the States at the moment, He and Wendy are members here. They founded New Frontiers, which is now this family of churches, 1,800 churches around the globe. Terry Virgo came to faith when his sister led him to Jesus. Um, His sister came to faith at a Billy Graham mission. It could be easily and fair to say our church would not exist if it was not for the life of Billy Graham. And the fact that he knew what his life was about as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. He also said this once, my home is in heaven I'm just traveling through this world. And actually, that quote is hugely significant for what I'm talking about this morning. So I want us to talk about what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven when it comes to how we handle our finances, when we come to handle our money and possessions. We're called to live as citizens of the kingdom of God, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And actually, this idea of seeing our world as temporary because God's called us to eternity is actually hugely significant when it comes to thinking through what we do with our money and our possessions and our finances. We're talking about how we handle our money and possessions in the kingdom of God. At the start of this series, I said there's two kingdoms that exist that we need to be aware of. There's the kingdom of God. And there's a kingdom of the world, and the kingdom of God has certain values and priorities in a culture, and the kingdom of the world in which we live has certain values and priorities and a culture. And maybe this area of money and finances is where we see those two kingdoms clash most obviously. But also maybe the biggest wrestle in our hearts, because dare I say it, when it comes to money and possessions, our attitude towards it can be so much more influenced by the kingdom of this world than the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God looks and feels different to the kingdom of this world. In Romans, it says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. May I suggest that in the area of money and possessions, it's one of the biggest battles in our hearts and our minds not to conform to the pattern of this world, what the world does with money and how we handle it. We're not to conform to it. We're meant to live differently. We're called as citizens of God to live with different priorities. We'd have an eternal perspective on our finances and resources. You know, we live, don't we? We live in such a consumer driven, materialistic society and culture. And Jesus' teaching about money absolutely confronts head-on that culture in ways that are incredibly confrontational. There's a massive link between our understanding of the kingdom and what we spend our money on. And it is linked to this idea, that Billy Graham quote, that we're just passing through this world. So don't let's get caught up on temporary things. Let's think about eternal things a little bit more. Now, listen, if you don't normally go to church or if you're new to the Christian faith, you may not know that Jesus spoke more about money and possessions than many, many other subjects. He spoke more about money than he spoke about heaven and hell combined. 
It was a major theme of his teaching. And actually, Jesus consistently and regularly taught about how our understanding of the kingdom impacts how we handle and use and view our money and our possessions. For Jesus, what we do with our money actually tells us something about what we really believe about life. For Jesus, what we do with our money actually tells us something about what we really worship. There's an American pastor called Brian Cluth who said this, your bank and credit card statements are theological documents. They'll tell you who and what you worship. Your bank and credit card statements are theological documents. They tell you something about what and who you worship. What we spend our money on tells us something. We need to be aware that we see hundreds, if not thousands, of messages every day on billboards and in shopping malls, on TV and radio adverts, on product placement in movies, and sponsorship of sports teams, and banner ads on websites that are telling us every single day what we should think about and do with our money and our resources. Every day, hundreds if not thousands of messages. And so we need to ask ourselves a question. Is my relationship with money and possessions more influenced by what I see every day on TV and in shopping malls and in product placement in movies, or is it influenced by the Word of God and by what Jesus says? What influences our decisions the most? Because it's so important we understand that how money is viewed and used and treated in the kingdom of God is very, very different to how money is viewed and used and treated in the world in which we live. This stuff is so important. Jesus made some hugely profound statements. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 if you can. Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to read one verse, and it's going to be the basis of everything that I'm going to say today. Matthew 6, 24 says this, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and you will love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot, you cannot serve both God and money. You can't serve God and serve money. Now, Matthew 6, if you look at the whole chapter, a lot of actually Matthew 6 is about money and finance and possessions. Right at the beginning, Jesus says, when you give, and he's talking and giving instructions about when you give your money. For Jesus, it is assumed that people will give. He was a Jewish man born into a Jewish culture and in Jewish law. Your first fruits, your first 10%, your tithe went to the Lord's. It was just a given, and Jesus assumes when you give. He says, when you give, don't do it for show. Don't ask anyone to congratulate you about it. Just get on with it. Just give. It's part of your worship to God. That's how it starts. And then later in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, it says these radical things where he says, you shouldn't store up for yourself treasures on earth. Don't store up treasures on earth. Why? Well, because it's a bad investment, basically, is what Jesus says. The stuff that you put all your money in, it's going to either rot or rust, or it's going to get nicked. That's what Jesus says. It's not eternal. Why would you put your stuff in stuff that's not eternal? Instead, store up treasures in heaven, which will last forever. Think about how you're investing in the kingdom of God that is eternal. In fact, in Luke 12, 15, Jesus says this, Watch out. Like, be on your guard, he says, against all kinds of greed because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Watch out. Be on your guard. Jesus is really clear about this. Don't stockpile money and possessions on earth because it's temporary. He's not saying money's wrong. He's just saying, I really want you to think carefully about where you invest it. Because actually we invest our stuff Our money and stuff that is so temporary. Stuff that we can't take with us into eternity. Stuff that will end up at Burgess Hill Tip. Or people will nick it. Or your car will get damaged. And new iPhones will always have a newer model to replace them. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. If ever there was a generation that needed to hear that verse, I suggest it might be ours. Instead, Jesus says, store up for yourself treasure in heaven. Invest your money in the kingdom of God. Because that's where real eternal treasure is going to be. He says, where your heart is will actually determine where your treasure goes. 
If your heart is for the kingdom of God, that's where your money and possessions will flow. If your heart really is about what the world offers, that's where your money and possessions will flow. It's about a heart thing, you see. Don't store up treasures on earth. In fact, Jesus told a story about a guy who kept building bigger and bigger barns to put all his possessions in. Do you know what Jesus called him? He says, you're a fool. That's what he said, you're a fool because you are storing up for things for yourself and you're not rich towards God. No one can serve two masters. That's the context Jesus is talking about. You cannot serve both God and money. Only one of these things can be your master. If God is God and master of your life, then money can't be. If money is master of your life, then God isn't. You can't be devoted to both of them. They actually kind of represent two kingdoms, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of money, and Jesus has called us to work out in our lives, which one of these two things are we going to serve? Which one of these two things are we going to allow to be our master? And the citizens of the kingdom of God, we're not to conform to the pattern of this world, but be shaped by the values of the kingdom of heaven. How we view money should be different than people around us. The degree that we find fulfillment in money should be different than those around us. The hope that we place in money should be different to those around us. What we do with our money should be different to those around us. This profoundly challenging teaching. One commentator said that Jesus, with embarrassing directness, is confronting us about what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So who's calling the shots in your life? Is Jesus or is it money? Um, that's a, a challenge that a rich young guy had once. Uh, there's this young man, he's a very wealthy young man, and he went up to Jesus and said to Jesus, we read about it in Matthew 19, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What good thing must I do to get eternal life? And I have this conversation that ends up with Jesus saying, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. There's that treasure in heaven line again. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. What's going on here? This guy's trying to live under two masters, and he discovers that you can't. He wasn't willing to relinquish control of his cash. Or maybe it's easier to say that his cash had too much control over him. He wanted to have eternal life, but he didn't want to lay down his wealth because you can't serve two masters. Jesus knew this was the issue in his heart and says, give away your cash, but he couldn't. We think that we're masters over our money and our possessions. What Jesus seems to suggest is that without care, our finances and possessions become the master over us. They end up determining our choices and our motivation and our priorities. So what would our response be if Jesus called us to give all our money away what is our response to Jesus as he calls us to be generous with our money? How much is enough? How much is too much? What's possible? What's practical? If we feel reluctant to let go of even a little bit of our money, does that suggest that money may be a master over us? Many of you will know this guy, Russell Brand. I read a fascinating article about him recently in which he says this. He said, I to um, my personal feeling is that the teachings of Jesus Christ are more relevant now than they've ever been. He's on a journey. I wouldn't say from the article that he's clearly put his hope and faith in Jesus, but he's talked to spirituality. He said, I subscribe to the teaching of Jesus, is what he kind of said in it. And he actually made reference in this article to this rich young ruler that I've just been talking about from Matthew 19. And Bran says, to give away all your possessions and follow me, that's a pretty radical thing to ask. He goes on to say that the reason why this is so radical is because it strikes at the core of the values so many people hold that money and materialism can cure our unhappiness. He says, I think the reason that the economic arguments Christ offered are not promoted is because they are deeply at odds with the way we live. And that's Russell Brand saying that. The Bible is deeply at odds with the way we live when it comes to this subject. Deeply at odds. It says many people think money and materialism can cure their unhappiness, so they try to accumulate more and more. But what the Bible says, what Jesus says, is at odds with our culture. Our culture says accumulate, consume. It says that money is ours to do with what we please. Jesus says live simply, give away. Our money is God's to do with what he wills. 
So who's going to be your master? Is it money or is it God? Can't be both. Can't be both. In fact, Jesus' teaching goes even further than this, even more radical, even harder, actually, to hear. In Matthew 19, 23 to 26, he says this, Truda, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, well, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. It's easier for a camel, think about that huge animal, to go through the eye, the tiny opening of a needle. He says, that's easier than for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven. What? Why did Jesus say that? Why did he have to say that? Why did Jesus suggest it's hard for wealthy people to enter God's kingdom? And who are the wealthy, anyway, that he's talking about? I mean, is Jesus talking about the 1% of the world that own 50% of the world's wealth? That's who he's talking about, maybe. Or maybe not. The reality is that if you have any money saved at all, it doesn't matter how little it is, and a hobby that requires some equipment and some clothes and a wardrobe and a car and your own home, you're in the top 5% of the world's wealthiest people. So who's Jesus talking to? Why is it hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of God? I think it's because Jesus knows that wealth can bring a full sense of self-sufficiency. That wealth can bring a full sense of confidence in ourselves. Leads us to materialism and wealth can lead us to an independence from God and actually from one another we can end up thinking we don't need anyone and we don't need God, and all this is so opposed to the humility and submission needed to recognize Jesus as Lord, to enter his kingdom. We hear that all the time, don't we? I've heard people say, well, the gospel, it's really hard work in Mid-Sussex, because there's so many people who are wealthy, and it's like they don't really need it. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. People who don't think they need the gospel, because, well, my life is good, I've got, I've got a nice house, going nice holidays, everything's well. Everyone needs Jesus. doesn't matter what the quantity of your bank balance is. And this is what Jesus is saying. It's hard. Praise God. It's not impossible with God. <laughs> he draws us by his grace. He makes it possible. But it's hard. So what do we do then? What does a kingdom-centered approach to money look like? Are we to give everything away like Jesus called the rich young ruler to give everything away? But then what about my mortgage or my rent and where do I live and what about my job and how do I buy food? And what about paying council tax and contributing to society? And I've got a car, I've got to pay tax for that, otherwise I get arrested. How, how does this work in practice? These are things we've got to work out. It's actually why things like the money course are so good. Because sometimes you've got to stop and just ask ourselves some questions about money. And what we do with it and how we think about it. What's it for? Where we get our answers about this from? And we've got to get our answers, church, from this book, not from shopping malls and magazines and newspapers, because they're going to give you an answer about what to do with your money. It's not God's answer. Now listen, I want to be clear this morning. The Bible does not say that it's wrong to have money, okay? Jesus was supported by business women who gave their money to support his ministry. So it's not wrong to have wealth, but the Bible does give us some warnings about money. The Bible does give us some guidance on how to handle money, and the Bible does tell us why money is a terrible master to follow. And in the minutes we've got left, I want to give you a number of reasons why money is a terrible master to have, according to what the Bible says. And the first reason is this, that we should be careful with money, and money is a bad master because money can choke the life and the word of God out of us. So what Jesus says, he tells a story about a farmer who sows seed. And the seed is being sown, and some of it goes in good soil, and it grows up to be a good plant. Some of it, seed falls on the path, and it's taken by birds and snatched away. Some soil goes on shallow soil, and um, some of the seed, and there's no deep roots there, so it withers and dies. Other seed is sown amongst thorns. And though it grows up well, thorns come up and choke out the life of that plant. Uh, overwhelm it. And in Matthew 13, Jesus says this. He says, the seed that falls among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, 
But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Jesus says some people hear the word of God. They respond to God. Something grows up as an evidence that the life of God is within them, but then the deceitfulness of wealth chokes out the word of God. It's like this other plant grows up and overtakes what God has begun in someone's life. Wealth, because it's deceitful, because you put false hope in it, and you put your trust in it, and you think it's going to promise something it doesn't deliver, and yet it can choke the word of God that is in you. Paul says something similar to his friend Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 7 to 11. He said that we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. And then listen to this. He says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Wow. Some people so eager for money have wandered from the faith. This isn't just theoretical. I've seen it. I've seen people that started well, with the Lord, and yet a love for money has choked out the word and the life of God in them. And the Bible says it's deceitful. It doesn't, it doesn't give what it promises. So be careful about money. How, how sad that some would wander from faith in Jesus because of money. Be careful. It's a bad master. Second reason it's a bad master is because it's a false hope. Further on in that chapter in Timothy 6 verse 17 to 18, Paul says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. So here again we see clearly People in the New Testament church who were wealthy, who had money, there's no problem with that. It doesn't say there's a problem. But Paul says, command those. It's quite rare that we actually see that word command. But here we see it in the New Testament. Command those who are rich in this world, which would include many of us here, not to put your hope in money. Because it's uncertain. Wealth is uncertain. Pension funds are uncertain. Jobs are uncertain. You cannot put your hope in money, but we all do. If we're honest, don't we? We all do. We think if we just had enough, we'll be okay, but how much is enough? The Bible is clear. If we follow Jesus, if we're kingdom citizens, there is one place and one place only we put our hope, and that is in the Lord. Don't put our hope in money. It can be all too easy to find our security in the balance of our bank accounts rather than the person of Jesus. And what's the alternative? What does Jesus, um, what does Paul then say to the rich people in this church that Timothy is leading? He says, instead, command them to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. Not wrong to have money, but don't put your hope in it. Instead, if God's given you resources, then be generous and willing to share. That's why God's entrusted you with those resources, that you can be a blessing to others. Don't put your hope in and money and stockpile it for yourself. Be generous and be willing to share. Don't put your hope in it. It's a bad master. Third reason why money is a bad master is because it does not satisfy. Jesus alone satisfies. We think it will satisfy us, but it doesn't. So Solomon um, in the Old Testament was wealthier than anyone you could ever dream. He had more gold than you could believe, more palaces than you could ever have. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, Solomon wrote this, whoever loves money never has enough. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income, and this is meaningless. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied. Don't we know that to be true? I read a story a couple of years ago in um, the Times um, newspaper about a guy called Sam Polk, and Sam Polk worked on Wall Street and um, he tells a story when he was told one year what his annual bonus would be, and his annual bonus was 3.6 million. 
dollars. That was his bonus. And he tells her about how he thought, that's amazing. It's three times more than my bonus last year. And then immediately he heard another voice saying, beat that next year because that's not enough. And he, he talked about this culture that he got caught up in Wall Street of greed and how it was killing him from the inside out. He said that he was, where's the quote, a giant fireball of greed is how he described himself. And in the end, he quit working on Wall Street because he hated who he was becoming. And the article finished with him saying this, financial wealth does not equal real wealth. And there are so many people on Wall Street who are depressed using drugs, sex, prostitutes to fill the pain because the money just never does. If you have a life focused on self and accumulation, no matter how wealthy you would get, there is just no satisfaction at the end of that road. There's Sam Polk in the Times newspaper in 2016 saying exactly what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 3,000 years ago. Whoever loves money never has enough. The accumulation of wealth does not satisfy unless you're accumulating wealth in order to be generous and to give into the kingdom of God. Money for money's sake won't satisfy you. That's why it's a terrible master. Fourth reason the Bible paints for why money is a bad master is because actually, Jesus says, it causes us more anxiety and worry. We think we all, that um, money causes you anxiety when you don't have it. The Bible says, well, money causes you anxiety when you do have it as well. Solomon, again, in all his beautiful wisdom in Ecclesiastes 5, the sleep of a laborer is sweet whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. As for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Why? Because the more you have, the more there is to worry about. The more you have to insure, the more you have to try and protect. The more you own, the more you insure. The more expensive the car, the greater the cost when someone will drive into the back of you. And the grumper you are when that first scratch goes into the paintwork. The greater the wealth, the more the gates, the more the alarm systems, the more the security cameras. Why? Because the more you have, the more there is to lose and the more there is to worry about. We think money might lead us to less anxiety. The Bible suggests it leads you to more. Maybe this is most brutally seen in the banking crisis of 10 years ago when banking executive after banking executive committed suicide because of deep sense of hopelessness and anxiety about the state of their wealth. The Bible says we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Even what we think are the fiercest and firmest financial kingdoms can be shaken. We have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 6. When he says you can't serve God and money, he says, so do not worry about your life, about what you'll eat or drink, or about your body or what you wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Can any of you by worrying a, add a single hour to his life? So don't worry saying what are we going to eat or drink or what are we going to wear? The pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and these things will be added as well. That verse about seeking first the kingdom of God comes in the context of talking about money and possessions. Don't run after all of these things. The message beautifully says it this way. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Those who don't know God run after these things. No, don't run after those things. Seek the kingdom of God. God knows what you need. See, actually, money's a bad master because it causes us anxiety. Jesus offers us peace. Final reason is that money can become your master, and that itself is reason to be careful. We think we own our wealth and possessions. Jesus suggests that they own us, that they own us. An example of that may be of this kind of slavery to the master that is money is the massive personal debt crisis in the UK right now. I recognize some of us have mortgages and that's the only way we can buy a house. I recognize others can't even get on the housing ladder because of house prices. I get that. I recognize that there are people today here 
in debt because of circumstances outside of your control, whether that be benefit cuts or whatever that is, I, I understand how hard that is. But much of the personal debt in the UK is actually because advertisers and marketers have told us that we can have anything we want and we can buy it whenever we want, even if we don't have the money. And the way to do that is get a credit card or a store card, because then you don't even have to wait for that thing that we promise will bring you satisfaction and happiness. And it's going to make your life so much better. And then we find ourselves in debt and unable to keep up with the repayments. And then there are those payday loans that are an outrage, charging a thousand plus percent, exploiting actually some of the most vulnerable in our nation, people who need cash now, and the spiral of debt increases. We're told, by now you'll be happy. Don't wait, put it on credit. And what happens? We become slaves to the very thing that is promising us happiness. That's why we run King's Money Advice Center here. Over 20 years, we've been trying to help people get out of the crippling impact of debt. Scores and scores and scores of people to get them back on a firm financial footing. And I want to just encourage you today, if you are in debt, whether that's because of circumstances outside of your control, or whether it's because of your own personal spending choices, can I recommend you contact King's Money Advice team? You'll find it in the King's Life magazine. You'll be treated with respect and love and dignity. There's a team that want to help you get back onto a firm financial footing. It's not just that debt places this unbearable burden on people, but actually debt stops us being who God created us to be because God calls us to be generous. And generosity seems so impossible when you're living in debt. It's about your very identity that it robs, not just your money. These guys would love to help you. That's what they're there for. Please, I encourage you, go and see our debt advice, our King's Money Advice Center. The Bible is clear. Money's not wrong, but it's a terrible master. Be careful because it can actually cause you to wander from Jesus. Be careful because it's a false hope. Be careful because it doesn't satisfy. It can often lead to more anxiety and it wants to be your master. I, I began this morning talking about Billy Graham. I'll finish with another quote from him. He once said, there's nothing wrong with men possessing riches. The wrong comes when riches possess men. Has money become your master? Do riches possess you? What's the answer to all of this? What does it look like? To seek the kingdom of God with our finances, it's going to have to wait for another time, I think. It can be summarized in one word. Kingdom of God's response to how we handle our money can be summarized with one word, generosity. Generosity. People who have wealth understand that if God has entrusted them wealth, it's not for them to build their own little kingdom on earth, but it's for them to invest so that God's kingdom may come on earth. God prospers us, as one author says, it's not to raise our standard of living, to raise, but to raise our standard of giving. To be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven is to have generosity in our DNA because God is unbelievably generous. The greatest and most generous act in the history of the universe was King Jesus making himself nothing being born into poverty in a stable, working in poverty as a carpenter, dying in poverty as a slave. The Bible says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might became, become rich. Jesus, for your sake, gave up everything, the greatest act of generosity the world has ever seen, and our response with our finances and possessions is in response to that grace given to us. It's not legalism, it's not duty, it's an overflow of a heart that says grace and love like mighty rivers flowed incessant from above. It's an overflow of responding to grace. Romans 8 says that God did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how would he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Our God is generous. His kingdom is generous. To be citizens of his kingdom means generosity. So who's your master today, church? I want to encourage you, for some of you, your response to today is to sign up for the money course because you never ask these questions. Go and do it. 
What harm is it going to do to have a fuller, a biblical understanding of how money works? For others of you, I want to encourage you, like I said, get to King's money advice. We want to help you be free of debt. For some of you, the response might be to think through what generosity looks like. Over on the table at the back there, there's this book, brilliant little book you can buy today, called The Treasure Principle by Randy Alcorn. It's a fantastic, inspiring, short little book that will give you a biblical handle on some of the stuff that I've been trying to say this morning. There's also another pack of resources about giving and generosity that you can pick up over there this morning. That might be the step that you need to take today. But for every single one of us, every one of us in the room, whatever our financial status, we need to reflect on Jesus' words one more time that no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Is Jesus Lord of your money? Is it submitted to him? Does he have permission to speak to you about what you do with your money and possessions? Have you ever asked him about what to do with your money and possessions? Let's pray for a moment, shall we?